The Boyhood Deeds of Ku Kaland. Introduction The Boyhood Deeds of Ku Kaland is not an independent tale, but rather a series of extracts from the Cattle Raid of Ku here presented in the earlier, less refined Levor Nechaide version. Fergus and a number of other Ulad chieftains have transferred their allegiance to Connachtra in protest at Conquerber's treacherous slaying of the sons of Elishlu. And now, with the Connachta about to attack Ulad, the exiles are describing to Alil and Mabe the boyhood feats of the great hero of the north. The first exploit recalls the opening episode of the Welch tale Prayer Dur. A naive, callow youth leaves his unwilling mother, he does not have a father, possibly because his real father is understood to be either royal or divine, and goes forth to find his proper companions. The boy troop of Emim Muche in one case, the knights of King Arthur's court in the other. Kukalon's feats with his ball and hurley, and toy javelin, and his complete dominance over the boy troop are superhuman, and at the same time, pure play. Prayer Dur, though merely precautious, is yet more mature, for, as well as outrunning deer, he dispatches enemy knights and even kisses women. The second extract explains how Cúcaland once saved Conqueror in battle. Even at this early stage of the Ulster Cycle, Conqueror's role has deteriorated, and already Cúcaland, as his sister's son, appears as his natural heir. The third extract explains how Satanta came to be known as Cúcaland. Such stories are common in Irish saga, but this explanation is unusually convincing. Why else would a young hero be called the Hound of Coulond? The mystery is rather in why the central character of the Ulster Cycle, a figure whose divine origin is manifest, should have been given a name so much more appropriate to a mortal hero, especially when his original name suits him so well. In the case of both Priory and Coulond, there are objections to the same name. Rhiannon asks whether her son's own name does not suit him better, while Cúcalón himself expresses a preference for his original name. But, in each case, the advice of a wise elder, the chieftain of Dyved in the Welsh tale, Cathlob in the Irish one, prevails. The fourth extract seems modelled on the tradition that Achilles chose a short life in order to win great fame. The episode at the end, where Cúcalón is seized by his Rishyarthre, or battle fury, has to be cooled off in vats of water, is entirely typical of him, as is his shyness in the presence of bare-breasted women. The antiquity of these extracts is open to doubt. The mythic element is slight, and there is considerable humour. In truth, he was reared by his mother, and his father, at Archek in Mag Mjordan Hay, said Fergus. There, he was told of the fame of the boys at Emin Muche, for three fifties of boys play there. Conqueror enjoys his sovereignty, thus one third of the day watching the boys play, one third playing Fidhil, and one third drinking until he falls asleep. Although we are in exile because of him, there is not in Eru a greater warrior. Kukuland entreated his mother, then, to let him go to the boys. You are not to go, she replied, until one of the champions of Ulad can accompany you. Too long to wait that, Kukuland answered. Just tell me in which direction Emuin lies. <sighs> to the north, there. And the path is dangerous, said his mother. Shlim Pwit lies between you and Emuin. Even so, I will try it, said Kukuland. He went forth, then, with his toy javelin, and his toy shield, and his hurley and his ball. He would throw his javelin on a head, and then catch it before it could strike the ground. When he reached Emuin, he went to the boys without first securing their protection. At that time, no one went to the playing field without a guarantee that the boys would protect him. Cúcalón was unaware of this. The boy outrages us, said Fulaman, son of Concobar. And yet, we know he is of the Ulod. The boys warned Cúcalón off but he defeated them. They threw their 350s of javelins at him, but he stopped every one with his toy shield. They threw their 350s of balls at him, but he caught them all against his chest. They threw their 350s of hurleys at him, but he warded them off and took an armful on his back. Then his Rishtare came upon him. You would have thought that every hair had been driven into his head. 
He would have thought that a spark of fire was on every hair. He closed one eye until it was no wider than the eye of a needle. He opened the other until it was as big as his wooden bowl. He bared his teeth from jaw to ear. And he opened his mouth until the gullet was visible. The warrior's moon rose from his head. Kukulon struck at the boys and overthrew 50 of them before they could reach the doors of Imwin. Nine of them ran over Konkabur and myself as we were playing Filhil. Kukulon sprang over the board after him, but Konkabur took his arm and said, Not good your treatment of the boy group. Fair play it is, answered Kukulod. I came from my mother and my father to play with them, and they were not nice to me. What is your name? asked Kotkabar. Satanta, the son of Sul Tom and of Deaktin, your sister. I did not expect such a reception here. Why did you not secure the boy's protection? asked Kotkabar. I did not know that was necessary, replied Kukulad. Accept my protection now then, said Kotkabar. That I will, answered Kukulad. That same day, Kukulod turned upon the boys in the house. What is wrong with you now? asked Konkabur. I wish that their protection be given over to me, Kukulod answered. Undertake to protect them then, said Konkabur. That I will, replied Kukulod. They returned to the playing field then, and those boys who had been struck down arose, and their foster mothers and foster fathers helped them. Another time, there was a falling out between the Ulod and Owen's son of Dyrthrath. The Ulod went into battle while Kukulod was still asleep. They were defeated. But Konkabar and Kuskrod Men Mehe and a great multitude survived, and their wailing woke him. He stretched so that the two stones on either side of him broke. This in the presence of Briahu yonder, and then he arose. I met him at the courtyard entrance, I being wounded. Alas! God preserve your life, Papa Fergus, he said. Where is Conqueror? I do not know, I answered. He set off then into the dark night. He made for the battlefield, and there he found a man with half a head, and half of another man on his back. <coughs> Help me, Hugolot, the man said, for I have been wounded, and I have half my brother on my back. Carry him a while with me. That I will not, replied Kukulon. The man put his burden on Kukulon's back. Kukulon threw it off. They wrestled, and Kukulon was thrown. He heard the bab from among the corpses. A bad warrior, he who lies at the feet of a spectre. Kukulon rose to attack the man then. He struck his head off with his hurley and drove it before him across the plain. Is Papa Conqueror in this battlefield? Kukulon asked. And his question was answered. He went on until he found Conqueror in a ditch, with dirt piled up around him on every side. <clears throat> Why did you come to the battlefield and the mortal terror that is here? asked Conqueror. Kukulon raised Conqueror up out of the ditch. Six Ulod champions could not have raised him more bravely. No, bear me to that no. house yonder, Conqueror said, and light me a great fire. Kukulod lit the fire. Good that, said Conqueror. Now if I were to get a roasted pig to eat, I would live. Kukulon went out and found a man over a cooking spit in the middle of the forest. One hand holding his weapons, the other cooking a boar. The man was terrifying. Even so, Kukulon attacked and took the man's head and the boar. Conqueror ate the pig, after which he said, Let us go to our own house. On the way, they met Kuskraid, son of Conqueror. He was badly wounded, so Kukulon carried him on his back. The three returned to Emin Mukhey. On the way, they met Kuskraid, son of Conqueror. He was badly wounded, so Kukulon carried him on his back. And the three returned to Emin Mukhey. Thank <laughs> you.
We knew that boy indeed, said the Canal Colonel. And we were none the worse for knowing him. He was our fosterling. Not long after the deeds Fergus had just related, he performed another feat. Kula the smith offered Conqueror his hospitality. He said that a large host should not come, but for the feast would be the fruit not of lands and possessions, but of his tongues and his two hands. Conqueror went with fifty of his oldest and most illustrious heroes in their chariots. First, however, he visited the playing field, for it was his custom when leaving or returning to seek the boys' blessings, and he saw Cuculand driving the ball past the three fifties of boys and defeating them. When they drove at the hole, Cuculon filled the holes with his balls, and the boys could not stop him. When the boys drove at the hole, he defended it alone, not a single ball went in. When they wrestled, he overthrew the three fifties of boys by himself. But all of them together could not overthrow him. When they played at mutual stripping, he stripped them all so they were stark naked. Well, they could not take so much as the brooch from his mantle. Conquer thought all this wonderful. He asked if the boy's deeds would be similarly distinguished when he became a man, and everyone said that they would be. He said to Cuculant then, Come with me to the feast, and you will be my guest. I have not my fill of play yet, replied the boy. I will come after you. When everyone had arrived at the feast, Kulan said to Conqueror, Do you expect anyone else? I do not answered Conqueror, forgetting that his fosterling was yet to come. I have a watchdog, said Coulant, with three chains on him, and three men on every chain. I will loose him now to guard our cattle and our herds, and I will close the courtyard. By that time, the boy was on his way to the feast, and when the hound attacked him, he was still at play. He would throw his ball up and his hurley after it, so that the hurley struck the ball and so each stroke was the same. He would also throw his javelin on ahead and catch it before it could strike the ground. The hound's attack did not distract the boy from his play. Conqueror and his people, however, were so confounded they could not move. They could not believe that, when the courtyard doors were opened, they would find the boy alive. But, when the hound attacked him, the boy threw away his ball and hurley and went at it with his bare hands. He would put one hand on the hound's throat and the other on his back and struck it against the pillar until every limb fell apart. The Ulaud rose to rescue him, some to the courtyard and some to the door of the courtyard. And they took him in to Conqueror. Everyone was greatly alarmed that the son of the king's sister had nearly been killed. But Kulan entered the house and said, Welcome, lad. For the sake of your mother's heart, as for myself, however, this was an evil feast. My life is lost, and my household are out on the plain. Without our hound, it secured life and honour. It protected our goods and cattle and every creature between field and house. It was the man of the family. No great matter that, replied the boy. I will rear for you a whelp from the same litter, and until it is grown and capable of action, I will be the hound that protects your cattle and yourself. I will protect all Mag Nehimni, and neither herd nor flock will be taken without my knowledge. Kukaland will be your name henceforth, said Cthulhu. I prefer my own name, said Kukaland. The boy who did that when he was six would not surprise by doing heroic deeds when he was seventeen, said Kono. There were other deeds as well, said Fiuku, son of Fur Fabe. Cathob the Druid was with his son, Conqueror, son of Ness, and he was teaching 100 men the Druid's art, for that is the number he used to instruct. One pupil asked him what that day would be good for, and he said that a warrior who took arms that day would be famous among the men of Eru, and that stories of him would be told forever. When Kukulon heard that, he went to Conqueror to ask for arms. Who instructed you? Conqueror asked. My tutor, Cthub. Kukalan replied. Indeed, we know him, said Conqueror. 
He gave Cú Chalánd a spear and a shield, but Cú Chalánd shook them in the centre of the house until none of the 15 spare sets of weapons in Conqueror's household escaped being broken or taken away. He was given Conqueror's own weapons then. These endured him, and he shook them and saluted Conqueror and said, Happy, the race and the people whose kings had such weapons. Kathub went to Conqueror then and said, Is the boy taking arms? He is, answered Conqueror. A luck then for his mother's son, said Kathub. But Conqueror replied, Why? Did you not instruct him to take arms? Indeed, I did not, answered Kathub. Then Conqueror said to Kukulond, Why did you lie to me, Sprite? No lie, King of the Fanny. He was instructing his students this morning, and I heard him to the south of Amwin, and thus I came to you, answered Kukulond. A good day then, said Kathub, for he who takes arms today will be great and famous, and short lived. Wonderful news that, answered Kukulond. For, if I am famous, I will be happy even to live just one day. The next morning, another pupil asked the druids what that day would be good for. Anyone who steps into a chariot today, Kathob replied, will be known to the Eru forever. When Kukulod heard that, he went to Conqueror and said, Papa Conqueror, a chariot for me! Conqueror gave him a chariot, and when Kukulod put his hand between the two chariot poles, it broke. He broke twelve chariots that way, so Conqueror's own chariot was brought from, and that endured. Kukulod went off in the chariot, taking Conqueror's charioteer along with him. The charioteer, Iber was his name, turned the chariot about, saying, Come out of the chariot now! But Kukulod replied, The horses are beautiful, and I am beautiful lad. Take a turn around Imwin with us, and I will reward you. After that, Kukulod made Iber take him to say goodbye to the boys, so that the boys may bless me. He then entreated the charioteer to return to the road, and when they arrived he said, Put the whip to the horses now. In what direction? asked Ibar. As far as the road leads, Kukulod answered. They went on to Schliebfweet, where they met Conal Karnak. That day it was Conal's turn to protect the province. Every Ulad warrior of Worth took his turn at Schliebfweet, protecting those who came with poems, fighting enemies, and seeing that no one came to him win and unannounced. May you prosper said Conal, and may you be victorious and triumphant. Return to the fort, Conal, and leave me here to watch in your place. Well enough that, said Conal, for protecting those with poetry, but you are not yet able to fight. Perhaps it will not come to that, said Kukalad. Let us go to look at the sandbar at Loch and Trey, for it is customary for young warriors to rest there. Very well, replied Conal. They started out, but Kukulod cast a stone from his sling and broke Conal's chariot pole. Why did you cast that stone, little boy? asked Conal. To test my hand and the straightness of my cast, asked Kukulod. It is an Ulod custom not to drive through danger. Therefore, return to him win, Popple Conal, and leave me here to watch. All right then, said Conal, and he did not drive across the plain after that. Kukulod drove off to Loch and Trey then, but he found no one there. Ivor told them that they should return to him wind and drink, but Kukulod replied, By no means, what mountain is that yonder? Shleem mourned wind, Ivor told him. Let us travel until we reach it, Kukulod said. They drove to Shleem Mondruin, and when they arrived, Kukulod asked, What is that white cairn yonder on the upper part of the mountain? Vidgarn. What is the plain yonder? Ogmabrig. Ebor then told them the name of every major fort between Timuir and Canadis. Moreover, he identified the meadows and forts, the dwellings and industrious plains, the forts and the great heights. He pointed out the fort to the three sons of Yachtashin, Foil and Fanel, and Tuilechil. Is it they who say they are not more of the Ulad alive than they have slain? asked Kukulad. It is they, replied Ebor. Let us go on then until we meet them, said Kukulad. Dangerous that indeed, said the charioteer. Not to avoid danger have we come, said Kukulod. They went on then and unyoked the horses at Kongbar Mane and away to the south and above the fort. Kukulod took the spacel, 
that was round the pillar and threw it in the river and let the water carry it. For such an action was a breach of Yes in the sons of Nyakta Sheen. The sons perceived what we had done and started out to meet him. But Kukulon went to sleep against the pillar, first saying to Ivor, Do not wake me just for a few, but only for a large crowd. Ivor was very frightened. He yoked the chariot and tugged at its skins and coverings, which Kukulon was sleeping on. But he dared not wake the boy, since Kukulon had said he was to wake him only for a grey crowd. The sons of Nyaktishin arrived then, and one of them asked, What is this? A little boy making an expedition in his chariot, replied Ebor. Neither prosperous nor auspicious, this first taking of arms, said the warrior. Let him lead the land, and let his horses not graze here any more. I have the reins in my hand, said Ebor. You have no reason to uncord the anonymity of the Ulad. Besides, the boy is asleep. Indeed, he is not a boy at all, said Kukulad, but a lad who has come in search of combat. My pleasure, said Fuil. Let it be your pleasure then, in the ford yonder, said Kukulod. You must take note of the man who comes to meet you, he more told Kukulod. Fuil is his name, and if you do not reach him in the first thrust, you will not reach him at all. Kukulod answered, I swear by the god my people swear by, he will not play that trick upon the Ulod after my father, Conqueror's brow's pointed spear, has reached him, an enemy hand mine. Kukulans cast his spear at Fuil and broke his back and took his head and his weapons. Take heed of the next man now, said Ibar. Fnal his name, and he treads upon the water as lightly as would a swan or a swallow. I swear by the god my people swear by, he will not play that trick upon the Ulod again. Indeed, you have seen how I tread the pool at him win. They met at the ford, Kukulan slew Fnal and took his head and his weapons. Take heed now of the last man, said Ibor. Tuchal, his name, and no mistake, for arms will not fill him. Here, then, the Dale Chish to confound him and make a sieve of him. Kukulan cast a spear at Tuchal, and the latter's limbs collapsed. He went and struck Tuchal's head off, and gave the head and the spoils to Ibor. They heard the wailing of the son's mother, Nyaktashin, behind them, but Kukulan took the spoils and three heads with them into the chariot, saying, I will not abandon my triumph until I reach Emma Mukwe. They set off with their victory and Kukulon said to Ivor, You promised me a good drive, and we need that now because of the pursuit behind us. They drove on to Schlieve Fuit, and with Ivor whipping, they went so fast that the horses overtook the wind and birds in flight. So fast that Kukulon was able to catch a cast from his sling before it could strike the ground. When they reached Schlieve Fuit, they found a herd of deer before them. What beasts are these that are so nimble? asked Kukulon. Deer, replied the charioteer. Would the Ulad think it better to bring them back dead or alive? asked Kukulon. Alive, for not everyone could do that. But all can bring them back dead. But you are not capable of bringing back any alive? asked the charioteer. Indeed I am, replied Kukulon. Whip the horses and drive them into the bog. Ibar did that. The horses struck fast in the bog, and Kukulon leapt out and seized the nearest, finest deer. He lashed the horses out of the bog then, and tamed the deer immediately, and bound it between the chariot poles. After that, they saw a flock of swans before them. Would the Ulad think it better to bring these back dead or alive? asked Kukulod. The bravest and the most accomplished warriors bring them back alive, answered the charioteer. Kukulon aimed a small stone at the birds and brought down eight of them. He took a large stone then and brought down twelve more with a stunning blow. Collect the birds now, he said to the charioteer. For if I go myself, the deer will spring upon you. Indeed, it will not be easy for me to go, replied Ivor. For the horses have become so wild I cannot go past them. I cannot go past the two iron wheels of the chariot because of these sharpness. I cannot go past the deer because its horns have filled the space between the chariot poles. Step on its antlers then, said Kukulod, for I swear by the god of the Ulod, swear by, I will return my head and fix the deer with my eye, so that it will not turn its head for you or dare to move. They did that. Kukulod held the reins fast, and Ebor collected the birds. Kukulod then bound the birds with strings and cords from the chariot, so that as they drove to Imimukwe, the deer was behind the chariot, the three heads were in the chariot, and the swans were flying overhead. When they arrived at Imwin, the watchman said, 
A man in a chariot is approaching, and he will shed the blood of every person here unless naked women are sent to meet him. Coquelin turned the left side of the chariot towards him when, and that was a gate to the fort. He said, I swear by the god the Olaid swear by, unless a man is found to fight me, I will shed the blood of everyone in the fort. Naked women to meet him, shouted Conquebar. The women of Imwin went to meet Cúchalán gathered around Mughain, Conquebar's wife, and they bared their breasts before him. These are the warriors who will meet you today, said Mughain. Cúchalán hid his face, whereupon the warriors of Ulad seized him and thrust him into a vat of cold water. This vat burst, and the second vat into which he was thrust boiled up with fist-sized bubbles, and the third vat he merely heated to a moderate warmth. When he left the third vat, the queen, Maguin, placed about him a blue mantle with a silver brooch and a hooded tunic. He sat at Conqueror's knee then, and that was his bed ever after. The man who did this in his seventh year, said Fiyaku, son of Farfabe. No wonder should he prevail against odds or demolish an equal opponent now that he is seventeen. 